Hi guys, Lisa DeLong here. I am the Director of Education and we have put together this Getting to Know You series and you have met so many of our staff. This is just so much fun to be able to spend a few minutes, a little bit of tea and coffee time and just a time to share some thoughts and ideas and answer some questions. So today we are so excited. We have Valdine Brown, most all of you know him. He is the co-founder of Neurooptimal System as well as the president and we are just so excited to have him and I have oodles and gobs of questions for you Val. <laughs> oh, there usually are. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming in with us for a short time. Yes, yes. Um, you know, a lot of the questions that I have are really generated by a lot of our, our community, um, whether we see them out and on the uh, websites or whether they're on Facebook or if they're in our courses, we just get a lot of different questions. And so I kind of wanted to ask you a little bit, um, one of the very first questions is, you know, we advocate that this is a training program and never a treatment. And yet, it's very easy to go down that little rabbit hole of treatment language. How do you see that kind of playing out when people um, communicate or dialogue together that you might be able to help um, them understand that they're going into that direction? Yeah, you know, part of the challenge is the, in my opinion, is the understanding that many people have of what training means. And so sometimes they say, well, you know, I go to the gym and I train, but I'm training because I have a specific goal. Well, from my perspective, that's more akin to treatment than it is training. The kind of training that I'm referring to is much more like what the Buddhist community talks about as training, like training the mind is the usual phrase. It means a practice that you do ongoingly and the idea of the practice is not to gain something, but it's to get rid of things. So it kind of goes back to the, the Tao Te Ching, which is one of the classics of Chinese philosophy by Lao Tzu. And Lao Tzu just means old guy. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> he was just the old guy. Um, uh, Tao Te Ching is uh, the way and its power, the way in its energy, the way in its flow. There are a lot of different ways to translate that title. But one of the phrases from it is to gain knowledge every day you gain something. To pursue wisdom, you lose something every day. So it's all about returning to what the Taoists would refer to as the uncarved block. And the, the Buddhist community talks about um, the ground of consciousness or pure consciousness, uh, chitta or rikpa, depending on whether you're in more of the, the Hindu tradition or the uh, Tibetan tradition. But the basic idea there is that to, as, as Tao Jin or, or Dogen said it, uh, one of the famous Zen writers in Japan, uh, to study the self is to forget the self. And to forget yourself is to finally see everything in its true nature, which is emptiness. Interesting. That, that's the kind of training we're talking about. <laughs> it's not training towards a goal. Uh, it's not, that's in, in the Zen language, that's putting like a snake. You know, you don't need to do that much. Now, that doesn't mean that this is just secretly some kind of Buddhist, Taoist. Eastern. No, of course not. Is that's a, a very convenient language uh, in many ways. And it's a language that's gaining ascendancy in the fields of neuroscience in particular. I've been very intrigued to see that. And increasingly, the field is converging towards the kinds of ideas that Carl Pribram and I used to talk about a lot uh, in terms of the hollow dynamic model of consciousness, memory, and perception, and that it's an interference phenomena. So it's, it's basically holographic in nature, but dynamical. And it, 
totally different from the way the rest of the, the field sees it. But increasingly, the field is converging towards that because they, they're realizing that the older maps that try to hyper-localize things don't work. Uh, you know, it's very interesting and useful in some ways to say, well, you know, the amygdala holds all the fearful memories and, and triggers those memories. Yeah, okay, that's fine. But the amygdala by itself doesn't do anything. It exists within this overall context. And that's <clears throat> kind of like saying the entire World Wide Web is dependent on my particular computer right here that holds my files. Well, that's nonsense. That's just not, it, it's, it's not even close to the way the thing works. So, you know, what's the difference between a training model and a treatment model? <clears throat> I would say it really depends on how tightly attached you are to the goals. And most folks come to neurofeedback for sort of two reasons in my experience. One is because they have a friend. That friend could be a coworker, could be a family member, could be, could be, could be. But the friend has seen very big changes in their lives, important changes. Mm -hmm. So the, the one who becomes a client says, well, gee, what'd you do? And they say, well, we, we did Neuropla. Oh, how's it work? Well, I, I don't know really, but I just go there and listen to music and I can listen to whatever I want. I can even watch movies but wow, I love their music and, yeah. and my life just changes. I don't, I'm not trying to make something different. It just becomes different. You know, I find I'm not as upset anymore when things happen. I can just witness them and then act in order to make changes or allow it to pass by. Yeah. It, it's, it's a very different orientation than the folks who come in and say, well, I'm anxious and I understand this might help get rid of it. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that reminds me of the, the Zen story. I know I'm on a Zen thing this morning, but the, the student shows up at the, at the monastery and he, the abbot greets him and he says, look, if I, if I really study, if I meditate all the time and I really work hard, how long will it take me? And the abbot says, 10 years. He goes, oh, okay, but look, if I, if I don't even sleep, if I just completely always, that's all I do is just work, 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 how long? 20. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, it, you know, the harder you try, generally, the worse it gets because it's that efforting yeah. that's part of the creation of what you experience as a limitation, a problem or a challenge or whatever you want to call it. Um, and so, it's a very different overall orientation. It and really is. We, we slip into it very easily when uh, someone will, will come in to inquire about sessions and say, well, you know, I'm having trouble sleeping. How long will it take? I can't tell you what your journey is gonna be. Okay, but how long does it usually take? It doesn't matter usually, you're you. <laughs> you're not usually. You're not usual, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just, it, we're so, we so easily fall into yeah. this idea that the average matters and in some ways it does absolutely you know if you're trying to figure out how many elementary schools to build in an area you know well it's useful then to know that the quote average american family has 2.3 children but the truth is no american family no family in the world has 2.3 children <laughs> children come as quanta you know? <laughs> well, you have three you can't have a point three okay <laughs> But, but in the context of trying to figure out, okay, what's a reasonable, you know, projection of how many children at what age will we have in classrooms? Okay, average can work. In other yeah. cases, you know, median is a better central tendency measure. But that's just not how we've been taught mostly in, in my experience. Right. So, yeah. Anyway, I know that was kind of a long answer, but... We're def very definitely not treatment, not, not goal oriented. And yet what we do is help clients start to notice differences in their lives. Because the other piece of many people and the way they live their lives as, as they're beset by the challenges and limitations is they don't see the little differences that make a huge difference. Uh, we're nonlinear dynamical systems. 
And the phrase in that, in that science approach, in that mathematics approach is um, small differences at the beginning can lead to exponentially different outcomes. So I, I uh, you know, you go to the airport and you go to gate 15 and you're flying to Los Angeles and at gate 16, there's a plane that's flying to Paris. Well, that's a, that's a small difference in the airport, <laughs> but a huge difference in the outcome. Absolutely. Okay. And, and so, you know, the, looking for small differences, it's difficult because if you're suffering from, you know, headaches, let's say, you know, you even have one, you might say that's too many. Well, but if you've been having one every day that lasts five hours, and now you're down to three hours, three times a week, that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And yet it can be experiences while I'm still having headaches. Right. You know, so part of the training approach is to really start to notice the differences because it's, we're looking for differences that make a difference or what in the more technical language is known as a distinction. You know, how is it really different is a way to talk about that instead okay. of missing it. Interesting. Well, and it, that is not only a, a perception change, but it's also just kind of semantics. The way we're using the word training is now really very different than what many people have ever thought of it as being. So that's, it's just an ongoing process, just like any other dynamical or any other dynamic system. So thank you for reminding us that again <laughs> and again and again. One of these days we'll all get it. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, as uh, one of our, our uh, uh, Zen Connect folks now, uh, she's been a rep and an instructor and long time uh, in the user community, uh, but she pulled out notes from uh, back in the day of, I think it was probably the first basic course that she took, uh, you know, back in, I don't know, 2003 or 2000, whatever it was. Uh, over in uh, the Netherlands, which was just a lot of fun. It was just a great time over there. Uh, but she said, I'm looking through it and you're saying the same things. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's crazy. I look through some of your old PowerPoints as I create some of these courses and I'm thinking, we haven't changed anything. And yet, sadly, some people haven't changed anything. <laughs> So we just we'll keep we'll keep plugging away and we'll learn as we go i'm sure so you know val one of the other things that's come up recently is um you know i i've been talking to someone who seems to think they're able to hear very specific interruptions in the music now we all know there are interruptions that's our feedback process and system and so forth um and i do understand that the brain's always trying to make sense of everything. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious, how would you put that um, into your language, the vowel language, um, so, that, <laughs> so that we can all understand that these interruptions, even though they might be microseconds apart, are still different? Yeah, it's a question of scale or scaling as referred to in, in fractal geometry. Um, and this goes back to a question that Mandelbrot asked, which is, how long is the coastline of England? <laughs> now, you know, I mean, yes, right. Mathematicians can ask interesting questions. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, Einstein's famous question still hasn't been answered. That kind of started this revolution in physics. His question was, if I wrote on a beam of light, what would I see? What would it look like? Well, nobody's been able to, to do that experiment. <laughs> and yet, if you start from the premise of what that would look like potentially, everything changes. So it's the same thing with Mandelbrot when he said, well, you know, what's the coastline? What's the, the length of the coastline of, of England? And it all depends on what size ruler you use. If you use a mile long ruler, you get a certain number because you're, you're taking out all the little nooks and crannies in the coastline that are less than a mile in length. If you use a millimeter 
ruler or an inch ruler, you get a vastly different number. And if you try to cross translate them, transform them one into the other, they don't equal each other. Right. The scale that you use to look at something makes a huge difference. Consciousness looks at things in very large scale. So uh, I'm, I'm in a building right now looking out through a window and across from me, I see other buildings and they, they appear very solid. And in many ways they are. They're very tightly packed with, you know, atoms and molecules and all kinds of stuff that very tightly bound together. And yet if I go small enough, if I could see reality like an electron sees it, it would look like the universe. It would look infinitely spacious because compared to the size of an atom, an electron is very, very, very small. Yeah. So, you know, how solid is reality? Well, consciousness looks and says, that's a building, that's solid. If I run into it, if I try to hit it with my hand, I'm going to hurt. It's going to hurt. Well, of course, that's macro and macro. For sure, that's you're going to feel it, and that's correct. However, the unconscious ability to perceive things is vastly more rapid and has to be. I mean, all the good studies show that very clearly, before you quote make the decision consciously, you already made the decision half a second before, anyways. In a blink. In a blink. <laughs> so, and it's not just that it's time delayed. It's not, that, yeah, you made the decision, but it took that unconscious process the same amount of time to make the decision as it takes consciousness to go, yeah, I think I'll, I'll have an ice cream cone. You know, no, the decision is made very, very quickly. That's on the order of a milli or microseconds. So when, when folks say, okay, but I hear, you know, every five seconds, there's an interrupt. No, there isn't. That would mean that every 5,000 milliseconds, exactly 5,000 milliseconds, there are interrupts. That never happens. One millisecond doesn't make any difference to your conscious perception. It makes all the difference in the world to unconscious perception. Those of you who are musicians and have listened to some of the early generation of electronic music uh, understand this, but in a slightly different way. When computers were first developed uh, to use MIDI interfaces and those sorts of things to generate sounds, people made absolutely metronomically precise music and everybody hated it. Yes. <laughs> It was like too mechanical. It just didn't work. So they had to work a little bit of slide back into it. You know, it's kind of like that old song, right? You know, don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true because the, 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 the unconscious perception of that exact periodicity is unsettling. Yeah. Help. So even one millisecond makes a difference. And in general, those one millisecond different interrupts are incredibly rare. Uh, and that, that's very interesting. Uh, you know, part of what I do uh, sort of back in the elves workshop, if you will, <laughs> is uh, I'm always looking at that level of the data. I'm always looking to see what's going on at sort of that millisecond to millisecond level of generation of interrupts and how that relates to the emergent EEG and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's, I have never seen in all of the time that I've looked at all of the EEG data, including no three data, version two data, previous data, data from other systems. I've never seen millisecond synchronicity like that in any of the data traces. It's well, that's just, good to know. Yeah, now it can sound like, oh, every five seconds. Well, that may be 5,100 milliseconds. And then the next one is 5,075 milliseconds, or 5,075 milliseconds. And then the next one is 5,137 milliseconds. Well, that's not exactly five seconds. It's not 5,000 on the nose. But consciously, 
it'll sound just like when you listen to jazz and it has that beat. And that do it metronomically, it's never exactly the same. That's just the way it works. Yeah. Well, good. That's a, a really good answer. It, that is very helpful. Thank you. Good. So now occasionally, and luckily not too often, but some people will say, um, I'm getting worse before I'm getting better. Is this something that um, people should tell their clients so they can expect that? I'm feeding you some bad words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's kind of the old thing about the, you know, the 11th commandment of cognitive behavioral. <laughs> Thou shalt not shit on thyself nor anyone else because you just feel shitty. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing what to tell people, um, because particularly if you're a trained, uh, psychotherapist or, or healthcare professional of some sort, um, there's a whole set of standards and practices that are important to engage in, to be in concert with that profession. And, and part of that usually falls under the rubric of, you know, uh, telling people what are likely outcomes. And, and fair enough, if, if you're a licensed professional and that's a stricture under which you, you operate, then you have to follow whatever the guidelines are of, of your profession. Uh, you know, in that regard, um, a long time ago, Sue and I both went on inactive status as psychologists because from our perspective, that whole body of practice had no relevance to what we were doing. Yeah. The approach of, of NeuroOptimal, uh, NeuroCare first and prior iterations and other systems, um, so totally different from that sort of thing that it just didn't make sense. It was, uh, didn't make sense for us to put ourselves out that way. There were a whole bunch of things we'd have to do if we remained active psychologists that we're just no longer relevant. So, you know, do, do you tell somebody, well, you, you may feel worse before you feel better. I mean, it, to my perspective, it, it's basically equivalent to saying, well, you may feel better before you feel worse. <laughs> and, and I'm saying that semi facetiously, but why should you predict? Because you, you have no idea what their life is. You have no idea uh, how many people eight months ago would have predicted this impact on society worldwide. Yeah, absolutely. And how would others have responded if they had predicted it? Right? So toilet paper would have been gone a long time ago. <laughs> That's true. Probably true. And, and, you know, part of the reason it's, it's interesting you raise that. But part of the reason for that is that your people are remaining home. And so the whole corporate uh, structure, supply lines, office buildings, various other places where people spend a lot of their time during the day, usually, uh -huh. people aren't there. So the toilet paper that is supplied to those places is not being used. <laughs> A huge demand on the rest of the system. You know, it's just, it's, it is interesting how all those things interrelate. So, you know, why do you say to somebody, either it, it, it may get better before it gets worse or it may get worse before it gets better. Yeah. I think much better to just say, I can't really tell you what your experience is going to be. I can tell you what other people have experienced. The challenge with that is that you're you. And yeah. regardless of how closely your experience may match others, it's unique. And we're concerned right now with you. So the point is not to notice is something better or worse, because that's already putting it within a linear context. Absolutely. Right? It's much better to start looking at the difference. It is different because small differences lead to bigger differences. And that doesn't mean that the small difference has to be judged as a good difference or a bad 
difference. It's just a difference. Yeah. And that can be a challenge for folks to get used to. You know, it's, it's, it's a very usual attitude to respond and say, oh, you know, this feels worse, whatever this is, yeah. right? Um, you know, I had really bad uh, shoulders develop over the last several years. And <clears throat> as that came on suddenly, and as I was faced with these new limits in what I could do, it was very easy for me to look at it and go, oh, this is really bad. You know, this, oh God, this really hurts. And, and it did, you know, it did hurt. It wasn't very helpful though. Right. You know, so given enough time, I learned and developed alternative ways of doing things. I would never have probably developed those had this opportunity not appeared. So was it bad? Was it good? It's always a little bit of both because the judgment is not what's important. I don't yeah. know how to say that, you know? Um, <laughs> I was, I was uh, chatting with my uh, eldest daughter, Sarah, a little while ago, and uh, she was asking me, you know, well, what were some of the really good experiences from when I was little? You know, the, the, and uh, so one of my favorites is when she was learning how to walk. And, uh, you know, we lived in this house that had this wonderful 1970s throwback green shag. Carpet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are a whole bunch of folks out there going, shag carpet? What's that? <laughs> you really don't want to know. Okay. You needed the same a ones that were learning to walk in it. <laughs> <laughs> so we had this sofa table that was there and, you know, she would stand up, right. And, you know, one hand kind of lightly touch it in the sofa table and, and, and take it off. And then she picked up both feet and went right down. Right. <laughs> and she just started laughing. And that was the next two hours. She <laughs> had to stand up. In there, pick up both feet and laugh as she. Oh, sweet! It was just cute, and it you know it's just the joy of discovery, yeah. right? So what am I going to say? No, that's not walking. Come on. <laughs> no, because that's the basis of learning. What's safe in the world? I know I can fall. You know, and and now I have I have a new joy, and I can do it. I don't yeah. have. To on anybody else doing this wow this is cool and then that emboldens you know more steps or little steps or the next steps or whatever so noticing those differences and being able to suspend the judgment allows us as the phenomenologist would say to see the thing as it is to let it show itself to us and that's when really interesting stuff can happen. Instead of just slamming your belief or your perspective or your whatever onto what it is or what it should be or right. what it shouldn't be. You know, it's, it's very interesting to allow that possibility to occur. And, and that ability to facilitate that sort of witnessing is really at the core of Neuroptimal. That's how we, we say, don't try to do anything. Don't try to not do anything. You know, just just hang out. Just enjoy. Just let go. You know, well, should I fall asleep? If you fall asleep, you fall asleep. Well, should my eyes be open? Well, if they are open, they're open. You know, that's how life is. Yeah, just be. Just be, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Oh, Val, I always, always, always love spending time with you. It's always so much fun and so informative. Oh, my gosh. Just love it. I have one request here at the end. Okay. Um, would you take one moment and talk to our lovely family and community about um, calm assertiveness in the middle of quarantine with all of our trainers? <laughs> uh, yeah, just an easy softball here, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it it kind of goes back to uh, there's been a, I guess it's called a meme or, or a gif, whatever, that's going around on Facebook every now and again, 
which is, you know, when you can't control the circumstance, and I would rather say when you can't influence the external circumstance, what you can control, what you can influence is your response to it. It very rarely is useful to get incredibly upset. There are times, and you know, for those of you who've known me over the years, you know there have been lots of times at a number of the conferences where for whatever reason, at a given time, I got quite animated. You know, was that the best? Now I'm back to the other question, right? Is that good or bad? It's what happened. Right? And that's just what happened, you know? Would it have been different if I hadn't gotten angry? I'm sure it would have been. I don't know what those differences would have been. Today, especially in this environment, calm assertiveness is what really counts because it's very easy to fall into a fear response. Oh, we don't know what this is. Oh my God, who made this happen? Oh, is there something you know, some nefarious plot out there. Oh, good grief, did it come from this government? Is it a terrorist thing? Is it that? Is it what's good? And all of that is actually prompted by a fundamental reality that a lot of us really just don't like to admit, let alone deal with, which is it's our death that gives life meaning. The philosopher Heidegger used to talk about your dying is your own most possibility. No one else can do it for you. Right. No one else can really do it with you. They can be in the room, but they can't do it with you, no matter what. It's your own most possibility. And something like coronavirus, whatever it is, whatever's caused it, whatever is going to help it go away, what, you know, whatever, regardless of that, it's a very stark reminder of that fundamental reality that, as, as Sartre used to say, we're all doomed to freedom, and that means even the freedom to die. That's just the way it is. And it's very easy to look away from that and move to anger, fear, sadness. And it's not that there's something wrong with those or bad or they shouldn't happen. It's just to notice them and with calm assertiveness, return to the present and yeah. what's, here, what's here to respond to. How can I help? How can I help myself? How can I help those around me? What can I do? And it's challenging because especially, you know, I mean, I'm, Sue and I live in, in British Columbia, in Victoria, on Vancouver Island. And, you know, Sam and Alex and most of the Zengar staff, uh, Alex is in New York, but most of the Zengar team are centered in and around Montreal. But there, there's you and Mark and there's the Z and, you know, everybody who's around and the dog too, you know, <laughs> they're in Vegas, uh, you know, and, and, and Craig is in California. Hani is over, you know, in the Netherlands. Dara is in Pittsburgh right now, you know, and I, I may be leaving somebody out. And we have so many folks on the team now that, you know, it's like, wow. Um, so there's, there's not a lot that Sue and I can do in the sense of, you know, directly reaching out to a lot of people, even though that's also sort of a natural proclivity now, particularly for those that you love and you want to protect and of course. do it, right? So <laughs> that's another piece of the calm assertiveness, right? It's this too will pass. And some of us won't be here when it passes. It's true regardless of what this is. Right. This in every life has that same dynamic. This too will pass, including me. Yeah. Hence, calm assertiveness 
And remember that every time you say hello to somebody, it's also important to say goodbye. We never know when it's going to be the last time. Sweet. Thank you, Val. Words of wisdom. And I so appreciate it. I know it's very comforting, I'm sure, to everyone. Well, thank you. I hope so. I'm sure. Thanks for that. Guys, thank you so much for joining us again. We have loved it. I know this, this one was a little bit longer, but we're hoping that you enjoyed every moment the way we do with every one of the interviews we've had. So Val, thank you so, so, so much. And I look forward to doing this again soon. Definitely. That'd be great. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you.